you can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. Hello everybody, today for the first time on the channel I am driving a Rolls Royce. Not just any Rolls Royce though, this is a Silver Seraph. And according to some, you could call this the last proper Rolls Royce ever made. <laughs> This really is one of those cars that has genuine significance for the company that created it. I am far from a Rolls-Royce expert, but I'm now going to do my very best to try and explain to you the story of how this car came about, what it meant for the company, and how it was significant for the future of the firm. Please forgive me if I make a couple of mistakes along the way. If you spot anything obvious, hop into the comments section and please do let me know. If you've never even heard of a Silver Seraph, you would be entirely forgiven. I expect you're more likely to have heard of its Bentley rival, the Arnage. This came from a time when the two companies were still intertwined. It doesn't help, I think, that all Rolls-Royce names sound very much the same. It's a bit like one of those games on the internet where your superhero name is the colour of your underpants and the last thing you ate. To create a Rolls-Royce name, all you need is a precious metal and something from the netherworld. For example, you've got the Silver Shadow, the Silver Spirit, then of course the famous Golden Ghost and Platinum Poltergeist. Just to bring everyone up to speed, Rolls-Royce has been around now for over a hundred years. In the 1930s, it acquired Bentley, a rival who, like many companies, made some lovely cars, but didn't really make any money. From then until the turn of the millennium, the two brands were intertwined, with Bentley almost becoming Rolls-Royce's AMG department. So if you were the sort of person who spent your time in that seat, you bought a Rolls. And if you're the sort of person who spent time in this seat, you bought a Bentley. At one point in time, the majority of Rolls-Royce products sold were actually Bentley items. They were mechanically very similar to the Rolls equivalent, and for many, the far more desirable item. As a company, Rolls-Royce is many things, but never modest, and it takes pride in telling everybody at every available opportunity that it makes the best cars in the world. The fact is, though, that come the mid-1990s, and that just didn't seem to be true anymore. They hadn't introduced an all-new model since 1980. And if you remember the 90s like I do, old Rolls Royces then were a little bit of a joke because you could pick them up for an absolute song, but they would then cost you a much longer, lengthier song to run. You could buy them essentially for the price of Song 2 by Blur, but the running costs were more I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that by Meatloaf. I think it's fair to say that most people's experiences with a Rolls-Royce were as a wedding car. For a very long time, it seemed like the default choice to take you to your nuptials was a slightly tatty 1970s Silver Shadow in white. The in-person was a bit tatty, but just about passable in photos. The Silver Seraph, simply put, was Rolls's salvation. The proof that they were still capable of making a car worthy of all the accolades they threw at it. To this end, it was quite a departure from the Rolls of old. Up front, you'd find a 5.4 litre BMW V12, codename M73, and essentially the same lump you'd find in an old 750 or 850. Rolls-Royce have never been particularly keen on publishing power figures, presumably because they feel like they are vulgar. Instead, they tend to call their cars adequate. But if you look up the specifications for this in a BMW, you'll find it makes around 320 horses, around 360 pound feet of torque, and it's about 490 newton meters. The car weighs some 2.3 tons, in other words, the same as a Taycan Turbo, bit of a joke that isn't it really and it has a five-speed automatic which if you've driven a much older Rolls-Royce like say a 70 Silver Shadow is an absolute revelation you can actually get in this and drive it more or less like a normal car there are no warning lights nothing is going bong at me the gauges all work and are pointing at the right bit 
even better than that, unlike the last old Rolls that I drove, all of its fluids seem to be staying vaguely where they're meant to be. This particular car belongs to a lovely chap called Steve, but it was his son Charles who actually offered it to me. He did things in the correct order by offering me the car first, then checking with his dad that it was okay. Uh, don't worry, his dad does know that I've got his car, and uh, thank you Steve, I'm very much enjoying it, because it is a lovely place to be. It's also the sort of car where I am completely ignoring the speed that I'm doing, because quite frankly, I do not care. Even though it doesn't have double glazing or soft clothes doors it doesn't really bother you because it's a fairly well insulated cabin and it is what you'd expect of a Rolls. Everything is wood, chrome, leather, aluminium and it's all most importantly real. Nothing in here seems to be spray painted plastic although I'm sure one or two bits may be. The colour also is absolutely spot on for a Rolls and it's called Sherwood Green. A nice change from the usual silver black or two-tone exterior and vastly better than the old wedding car white, which on some examples had been maintained so poorly you could still see the brush strokes. Inside, the only real giveaways of the BMW connection are some buttons on the steering wheel and the HVAC controls here, which you'll recognise from, say, old 7 Series, E46, the, that generation BM switch gear. What is rather disappointing, though, is the space in here. For a big car, there's not a lot of it. You can tell they prioritised the people in the back, because sat there, it's absolutely brilliant. I have, in fact, spent some time in the back of this when we were doing our drive-by shot, and it is a nicer place to be, as you'd hope. You've got, of course, the obligatory little picnic tables, and the treatment in the rear is very much the same as up front. So you have these gorgeous pieces of wood, and this being a very late car, a 2001, they ended production in 2002, you'll actually find a spirit of ecstasy very sneakily engraved into the wood. That is a beautiful touch. In a dramatic departure from the Rolls-Royce of old, where cars will be in production for two or three hundred years, this one spent ten years in development, having begun in the late 1980s and was then on sale for only four years, from 98 till 02. The reason, I believe, for this short production run is a function of what happened to Rolls-Royce and Bentley at the time. Vickers, who owned Rolls, decided they wanted to sell off the automotive division of it. Everybody assumed it was BMW who were going to buy in, because they already had a good working relationship. However, when the hammer landed, the person who walked away with the company was actually Volkswagen. They had made Vickers an offer they simply couldn't refuse. However, there were two key pieces of the business they did not get. The name and the badge. They could use the grill, they could use the engines. They got the factory up in crew, which had actually started life as a secret production facility to make aero engines ahead of a war that we knew was coming in the 1930s. A deal was then done between BMW, Vickers and VW, where it was agreed that BMW would take the spirit of ecstasy, the Rolls-Royce name, the rights to the grills, and that was about it. So in practice, Bentley got all of the physical bits and BMW got the idea of Rolls-Royce. This is why shortly after you saw Bentley's continuing to use the Rolls-Royce V8, whereas Rolls continued production using the BMW 12. And every single car to bear the Rolls-Royce name after the Silver Seraph is entirely unrelated to all of the models that came before. A new age for both Bentley and Rolls-Royce had begun, and it seems like both firms did rather well. While you've got ample room in the back, it is space up front that really suffers. I am only 5 foot 10, I have the seat in its lowest possible position with a bit of recline as well, and my hair is touching the roof liner. I don't even have that much of it at the minute either. I don't think anyone would ever expect a Rolls-Royce to have less room in it than an Elise. But this does. Boot space mercifully is excellent, and I suppose as we've got a little bit of open road, we should see what those 12 cylinders and 24 valves of BMW goodness can do when you put your boot in.
I think the Rolls-Royce term of adequate would suit absolutely perfectly here. The car does move. You get this faint distant whiff of V12. Sounds very much like the old BMW 12 that I had in my 7 Series. That's actually a much later and considerably more powerful engine. The suspension, as you might imagine, is very softly sprung. The body is actually 65% stiffer than the outgoing model, so it's a dramatic improvement. The benefit of Rolls-Royce and Bentley being intertwined firms was that Rolls-Royce didn't really have to worry about ever making a particularly sporty car. That was the job of Bentley. Regardless, this is still a very pleasant thing to steer. It is certainly effortless, but the steering has a little bit more weight, communication and feedback than you'd reasonably expect. Even over the roughest and most demanding sections of my test route, the car remains unfazed. The brakes do not fill you with confidence. The pedal is extremely soft, has quite a lot of travel, and I'm told this is something that the owners looked into and that's kind of how they're meant to be. Being a Rolls, of course, the car is filled with all sorts of quirks and features to make any Doug DeMuro fan giddy with joy. So you have no rev counter, but you don't have here the power reserve meter that I've seen on later cars. You've got a very nice clock, you've got a proper analog gauge for the outside temperature. The spirit of ecstasy up front looks absolutely marvellous. The seats in the back, of course, recline. The head unit is hidden here behind this little fascia. However, there is also an Alpine navigation system. So up top, you've got a unit that reminds me very much of the old BMW sort of E46 or more accurately Z4 style stuff. So a little pop-up screen. It's not a BMW unit though, I hasten to point out. And it even has its own little remote down here, which has a special little dock. So it doesn't go walkies when you don't want it to. There's a cup holder down here, which is very fancy, very nice to use. And the best bit about this car in many ways is the way it smells. This isn't really helpful information for many of you at home, but when you open the door on a car like this, or indeed an old school Bentley, you are greeted with the most wonderful fragrance of, well, pure luxury. Absolutely magnificent. I believe the main reason for the scent in here is the copious quantity of Connolly leather. I don't know exactly what it was that they did, they must have treated it in a certain way, but cars with Connolly leather just smell good, even after 20 odd years. So then, how much exactly are you expected to pay for this slice of old world luxury? As it happens, when it was new, a hell of a lot. Back in 2000, one of these would have set you back 155 grand. I'm not very familiar with the Rolls-Royce options list, but I'm sure they had one, so I think it's not unreasonable to assume people could have easily spent over 160 on these. To give you some context, that's about the same price as the then current Ferrari 550 Maranello, or, to put it another way, this morning I drove a 2001, so same year, Toyota Yaris T Sport, and they were 12 grand. So for the price of one of these, you could have had a dozen of those. In fairness to the Rolls-Royce, a Ferrari 456 would have been about £180,000, so actually even more than one of these. And this car had an even more upmarket relative, the core niche, the convertible version, more or less. Those were a cool quarter million quid. In modern money, that's about 480 grand. It's no wonder then that not many of these or the core niche were ever sold. Charles tells me that late model right-hand drive serifs shifted in only the dozens, and I can believe it. As you might have imagined, depreciation has done its thing. Here is where the Serif plays its trump card. Because it was a relatively late model car, these never really faded into that sort of ownership hell that many of the earlier models did. I don't believe you could ever pick up a Serif for about 10 grand, and now one of these will command anywhere it seems from around 30 to 70,000. This particular example has now just over 29,000 miles on the clock and feels legitimately like a new car. It's absolutely gorgeous in here, has been really well kept, and Charles tells me they didn't really have to do much to get it this way. Everything in here just worked. So the effort Rolls-Royce put into these, it seems, did actually bear fruit.
I would forgive absolutely anybody who still wanted an Arnage, and it's important to note that those were available only with V8 engines. Initially, the BMW lump, and then later, because of the split, the old school Bentley Rolls Royce 6 and 3 quarter. The last hurrah of this platform, really, was the Bentley Brooklands. A car I have experienced, did very much enjoy, and gives you pretty much the same vibe as this. I've yet to try an Arnage, in fact I haven't really driven all that many Bentleys beyond the very new and the extremely old, so anyone who's got something in between and would like to see it on YouTube, please do drop me a line. Uh, likewise, if you also have a Rolls Royce, I would very much like to drive some more of these and see how the model line progressed over the years. For now though, I want to say a huge thank you to Steve and to Charles for allowing me to drive their car. They in fact offered me a selection of different vehicles to choose from and I surprised them both when I said I wanted to have a go of this. It is a car which previously I knew absolutely nothing about and if you're in the same boat as me, hopefully now you know just a little bit more. And if you are a Silver Seraph or Rolls Royce fan, I hope I haven't done your car a complete disservice. One thing I would like some help with, there are mirrors in the back, positioned in the oddest of places, in the C pillar. We're not really sure what that's all about. Is it meant for people to sort of just check their makeup in, in place of the now fairly popular just drop down mirrors? Uh, someone in the comments, please do tell me. So from me, that's all for now. Don't forget to like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.